So the next thing we're going to be looking at here is how we connect that excitation to the actual contraction mechanism. And I started alluding to this a little bit already. So, but the second level of this is taking that excitation and connecting it to the contraction mechanism. And this is what we refer to as excitation contraction coupling. Uh, it's really that combination of what we did with the excitation at the motor end plate and transmitting that across the entire sarcolemma down to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So again, this is also going back to a lot of those cell parts that we talked about in the first one there. So what we did initially on this last one here is we excited that motor end plate. The binding of the acetylcholine attached to the acetylcholine receptors. We got a local depolarization due to influx of sodium ions into the muscle fiber. This leads to a local depolarization at that motor end plate. This is generally referred to as an end plate potential. It's localized only there. It can be, if it doesn't reach threshold, nothing's gonna happen. Again, it's transient. What happens is after it's happened, it can be restimulated again if it has started to repolarize. Uh, again, once this member potential reaches threshold though, we are going to get a depolarization of those voltage-gated channels. And when this happens, we're going to have sodium rush in to depolarize that cell going from negative 90 to about positive 30 millivolts. Uh, then what happens is those sodium channels get stopped. At that point, potassium channels open up and we get an exit of calcium. It's not calcium. Potassium channels open up and potassium exits the cell, gets it back to this repolarization. It actually goes a little bit past but this is that repolarization. So if you look at the two different channels and how they're working and how we get the depolarization and then the repolarization, that is what is occurring at this. And this is referred to as an action potential. Uh, what's gonna happen though is because once we trip one voltage gate and there's another one right next to it, when one depolarizes, it's gonna trigger the next one, which triggers the next one. And what this means is where like this image is showing at the right here, you're gonna get this traveling depolarization that is gonna travel over the entire membrane where there is voltage-gated channels. And we have voltage-gated channels everywhere except for the motor end plate. So we are gonna get this self-propagating, what we refer to as an action potential that travels over the entire membrane of the cell. It's gonna go from, again, this motor end plate right here, traveling in directions, in all directions, out from that motor end plate where there's voltage-gated channels. What's gonna happen in certain instances though is it travels across that membrane, it's gonna run into a T-tubule. We do have these voltage-gated channels down those transverse tubules. It's gonna work its way down these transverse tubules and spread through those as well. What is interesting on these is down in these ones, there is going to be some voltage-gated calcium channels that are in that sarcoplasmic reticulum. When that voltage change gets in close proximity to those, those voltage gated channels of calcium on the sarcoplasmic reticulum will be triggered to open up as well. And this will lead to an opening of calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If you don't remember, we were pumping a bunch of calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of uh, the muscle cells. So again, action potential triggered by that end plate potential here. We get this opening of the first voltage-gated channels, that depolarization of sodium going in, repolarized with uh, potassium going back out. But this is gonna trigger an action potential that travels over the entire sarcolemma down those T-tubules and continues to spread out over the whole cell. There is gonna be a little period of time from when you started depolarizing that cell until it's repolarized where it can't be re-stimulated. This is referred to as a refractory period on this one. So there is a short period of time when a muscle cell is being stimulated that it cannot be stimulated again. As these voltage gated channels through sodium and potassium channels open up and repolarize throughout the whole cell, we have some of this detraveling action potential that gets down into the sarcoplasmic reticulum area and triggers the opening of voltage gated channels there. These ones are gonna let calcium out of that sarcoplasmic reticulum because it's a high concentration there, it's gonna now flood out and this is capable of interacting with things in the cell. This is how we're going to connect this to the contraction mechanism. So again, this shows you this local depolarization right here, how it's gonna travel through these voltage-gated channels. 
it works its way along tripping each one of these until it gets down one of these two t tubules this depolarization here is going to change the membrane potential in the area by this sarcoplasmic reticulum which is going to cause these voltage gated calcium channels to open out and we're going to get calcium flooding out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm or sarcoplasm of the cell so what are the two events that we're calling that excitation track contraction coupling? It is going to be that connecting what's happening at the neuromuscular junction to what's happening at the actin and myosin fibers. And this is where that calcium becomes very important on this third step where we get to the actual contraction. This calcium, again, at high concentration, and if you remember, we have an actin and a myosin fiber, those thick and thin filaments. The thick filament was the myosin fibers. The thin filament was the actin with the tropomyosin surrounding it and those troponin molecules on that. At resting conditions, tropomyosin is in the way on the actin and the actin and myosin can interact. What we're going to see is something has to bind to that troponin to relieve this inhibition. Anybody willing to take a wild guess as to what is going to be removing that inhibition? It is going to be the binding of that calcium. So what happens here, we get this calcium that floods out. It is going to go and bind to that troponin. It causes the tropomyosin to change conformation, and this is going to open up bonding sites on the actin for those myosin heads. What can happen then is that myosin head can go up, it can connect, and it can do its little movement, which is going to pull those z discs closer together and overall shorten that sarcomere. If we're doing this along the whole muscle cell, you're going to shorten the whole muscle cell. So again, calcium binding binds to that troponin, causes a change, which causes the troponin and tropomyosin to move out of the way and expose myosin bonding sites on the actin. So normally, the myosin head right here cannot interact with the actin because the tropomyosin is in the way because nothing is bound to the troponin. When we have this calcium binding to it, it is going to relieve this inhibition, and then what we can have happen is those myosin heads are ready to attach, when that myosin bonding site and actin is exposed, those myosin heads are going to connect to it. They are going to have a little power stroke. So they're going to take an ATP and convert it to ADP and a phosphate. And it's going to pull that thin filament past the thick filament a little bit. What's going to happen then is we have to have a new ATP molecule come and bind in to reset that myosin head. It can then attach onto the next bonding site, do its thing again here. Another ATP comes in and it's going to do this repeating step over and over and over again. So you can kind of see it here at the top on this little animation. You have the myosin head binding, it hydrolyzes the ATP to ADP. We then have a new ATP come in, which will reset that head back so it can grab onto the next one here. What's gonna happen, as long as there's ATP, this cross bridge cycling is gonna keep happening over and over again. It's gonna reach up, grab on, do its power stroke, ATP reset it, do it over and over and over again. And this is another way of showing it here. Calcium binds to this, the myosin head can reach up, binds to it, does its power stroke, which spends that ATP. We then need an ATP to reset the head. It's going to reach back up, grab the next bonding site, reach back up again, do that power stroke, and we're going to do that again over and over and over thing to realize is it's not one myosin head binding to one actin fiber. You have hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of myosin heads that are all binding up and grabbing this. So when the one head releases, it doesn't go back to its resting state. There's other myosin heads holding that in place. So by this repeated cross bridge cycling, you're going to shorten, 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 and shorten that sarcomere until it's fully contracted. And again, you can see another example of it here, ATP binding and resetting this. So it's kind of like if you're climbing or pulling a rope, hand over hand, you always have something holding onto the rope, but each one is grabbing on, and that's those myosin heads binding up, doing their power stroke, resetting over and over and over again. And here's another one that kind of, again, shows it. You have the actin with the tropomyosin in the way with the troponin. There's binding sites on that troponin for calcium. Here's the myosin heads. They can't interact right now. When the calcium comes in, it's going to bind to these troponin complexes. It's going to cause the tropomyosin to move out of the way. We now have those myosin heads that are interact with it. The myosin heads can do their power stroke. ATP is going to be used to reset that. We'll see it do on both of these ones there. 
does that ATP will come in and reset it at least on this animation then it's going to start over again but it resets that head and then it can do it again again this cross bridge cycling can happen as long as there's ATP present and as long as the calcium is keeping that inhibition away so cross bridge cycling like I said as long as there's calcium present those myosin sites are exposed as long as there's ATP present those myosin heads can keep resetting and continue to contract what this is going to do overall is it shortens the sarcomere, causes that eye band to disappear, and brings those ends of the sarcomere closer together. And again, over the whole muscle fiber, we're doing this thousands of times over, so that is going to overall shorten that muscle. And you can kind of see it on this image right here, the little sarcomere and how it's shorter in that fully contracted state. So what is the calcium doing for us in this contraction mechanism? it is relieving that inhibition. So when it binds to the troponin, it causes the troponin tropomyosin complex to get out of the way on the actin and allows the myosin and actin to interact with one another. What is going to lead to the release of that myosin head and reset it? It is going to be ATP that is needed to rebind, to bind to that, to reset the head and allow it to do another power stroke and continue to contract. Again, there's other types of disease states that help tell us a little bit about this. So uh, you can have different things like uh, Clostridium tetani. So the tetanus toxin, it leads to spastic paralysis. It blocks inhibitory neurotransmitters in the spinal cord, which leads to the muscles contracting uncontrollably. Botulism is uh, a toxin that actually prevents the release of acetylcholine at the synaptic knobs, and that leads to what is called flaccid paralysis. You cannot contract the muscles because we cannot send a signal to these muscles. In order for relaxation to happen, this is not a non-active state. We need ATP for relaxation to happen as well. So we have calcium pumps in that sarcoplasm reticulum that are continuously trying to pump calcium from that sarcoplasm back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When acetylcholine is bound and those voltage-gated cha calcium channels are open, it can't reset this. If we stop releasing acetylcholine at the neurotransmitter, what's gonna happen is we're no longer gonna keep those calcium gates, those voltage calcium gates open, and everything's gonna start resetting that. What takes away the signal to start with is we actually clear that acetylcholine out of the synapse. We have an enzyme called acetyl acetylcholinerase, which is going to take that acetylcholine and it breaks it down. The only way for that signal to stay in there is you need to have the neurotransmitter keep, I mean the neuro, nerve, sorry, the motor neuron continue to release acetylcholine. We're going to have an enzyme that can, can continually tries to break it up. So if you stop releasing that acetylcholine, the enzyme is going to break up that acetylcholine. You're no longer going to have that end plate potential happening which is going to let that local depolarization stop and set it back to a normal state, which is going to then finish off that end plate potential. Those voltage-gated channels, as the membrane goes back to normal at that area, those voltage-gated channels are then gonna close, which is gonna then have this traveling repolarization travel over the whole membrane. Uh, it's gonna work its way down to those calcium-gated channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, those are gonna close. We have those calcium pumps that are continually working. It is actually going to then pump enough calcium in there. And once we remove enough calcium from the, the sarcoplasm, from that cellular, that cytoplasm, what's gonna happen is there's not gonna be enough calcium staying bound to the troponin to keep that inhibition removed. What's gonna happen then is the troponin myosin is gonna move back in the way and now the actin and myosin can interact. But again, you can see we need ATP to run all these pumps, the sodium potassium pumps to put the membrane back to normal, the ATP to run those calcium pumps to pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So even in muscle relaxation, it is an energy requiring process. Once that, like I said, that troponin goes back, the tropomyosin moves back in the way, and then that muscle is gonna be restored back to that relaxed position. And again, this is kind of showing this idea right here. You had acetylcholine, you have an inhibitory neuron that stops the release, and then acetylcholinerase is going to break up what's in here, remove that, 
And when this is all removed, that muscle is going to go back to a relaxed state. And again, it's a little bit of the elasticity of the muscles as well as antagonistic muscles that are going to help put this back to its normal length. When we start talking about strength of contraction, it really has to do with a number of different things here. Obviously, the more cross bridges we have in between the actin and myosin, the greater the strength of the contraction can be. We can also increase the strength of contraction by bringing more myofibrils activated. And then the main one is a lot of times we will activate more motor units that are going to get more contracting fibers. When it comes to increasing muscle strength, what you don't do is you don't make more muscle cells with, with strength training. You actually add more myofibrils and more cross bridges, which are going to lead to that strength of that contraction getting greater. Uh, again, when we fully contract a muscle, that means we're recruiting more of our fibers. So a lot of times we're going to activate more motor units to get a much stronger contraction. So really the last couple of things I want to talk about here, or one of which I have a slide for and one of which I don't, is a couple of these abnormal things that happen. But So after you die, something that, hopefully that's not anytime soon, but after death, you can get this sustained contraction of the muscles for a period of time called rigor mortis. There, the physiology we've been talking about is actually key to understanding what happens with rigor mortis. So rigor mortis is when somebody dies, their muscles will stiffen up for a period of time and can stay that way for a day or so. Upon death, we're no longer making ATP. Because of that, some of that calcium can leak back out and we can't pump it back in. And when this calcium gets released, it is going to go and interact with the actin and myosin, binds to that troponin, gets the tropomyosin out of the way. Those myosin heads can attach the little bit of ATP that's in there. It can contract the muscle a little bit, and because there's no ATP to reset anything or to get back to a fully relaxed state, what will happen is those muscles will stay contracted until more of the protein starts to break down in terms of decomposition, and then the muscles will lose that rigidity. So that's one of those interesting things with the physiology that explains one of these states that you may have heard of before. The other thing I want to talk about is the, the idea of if you've ever like a taser or grabbing something that's electrified. A lot of times you see in the movie somebody will grab onto something and they can't let go because it's electrified. A lot of stuff I talk about, it's not real in the movies when we talk about it, the actual real physiology, like shocking a flat line, you don't do that. Grabbing something electrified will actually do a muscle contraction. If we think about why this is the case, if you grab something that's electrified, it is a change in voltage, right? And what can happen is that change in voltage can actually trigger those voltage-gated channels to open. If you open up those voltage-gated channels, it's going to lead to all the whole excitation-contraction coupling stage taking place, and that muscle will go into contraction. The reason you can't release that is because you were never sending the signal to open it up. So the fact that that depolarization is happening due to the electricity, until you get the electricity removed from the muscle, the muscle is not going to stop contracting. When we normally do labs, what we actually do is a muscle stimulator lab where we put a couple electrodes on your forearm and I can actually make the muscle go like that by delivering an electric shock to the muscle. So that is actually another way that kind of explains that uncontrolled contraction with electrocuting a muscle if you've ever seen a TENS unit, same idea. When you deliver that electricity directly to the muscle, it opens up those voltage-gated channels and is going to finish off that whole idea of excitation, contraction, coupling, where you're going to get the release of the calcium, the actin and myosin interact, and you get a contraction. So this is, and you may have to watch this one a couple of times, this is actually how muscles go about contracting. Uh, what we're going to start talking about over the next few shows here is we now have to address a little bit about how does the muscle get AETP to continue this contraction? And we're going to see we can't just store it all up in the muscle. So then we get in the process of what are the different sources that the body uses to generate ATP to do any type of sustained activity.